Yes, hello everybody. Uh, I am uh, Christina Petracchi and I head the FL uh, eLearning Academy. Uh, we are extremely pleased to uh, welcome you to this first of a series of international technical webinars that the FAO eLearning Academy is organizing with um, the United Nations Economic and Social uh, Commission for Asia and Pacific, together with uh, Agrinium, which is uh, a big network of, um, of French um, uh, agriculture and food sciences institutions. So the, the, the objective of these uh, webinars um, the objectives are really to try to have an open space to share and, ex and exchange knowledge and, and, uh, and experiences. And um, on, uh, on thematic areas, on, on the global challenges that we are all facing, basically. All the thematic areas that will be covered in the, in the webinars uh, are all aligned with the with the SDG with the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030, and uh, all these different uh, thematic areas are also covered um, in a, a number of um, uh, of e-learning courses, uh, which are offered free of charge uh, by the FAO um, e-learning Academy. So uh, I just wanted to share with you uh, right now um, the, the, the link to the FAO eLearning Academy. Um, this, uh, this is a, a, a multilingual platform that offers free um, multilingual e-learning courses on, on a number of thematic areas, which are all gonna be covered in the various um, webinars that we will be having. So uh, just a few uh, more, um, more words. Um, if you wanna ask questions, you just have to click on the, the chat button, which is um, on your screen uh, underneath and um, we will try to do our best to answer all the questions. We will also be gathering all the questions and all the answers in a document afterwards. And this webinar uh, is being recorded in order to give the opportunity to the colleagues and to the uh, professionals in other time zones to benefit from, from these webinars. Um, so just to let you know, we will also be informing you about the next ones. So there is an agenda for 2020 of all the different webinars, which are going to cover a number of thematic areas, such as uh, soil management and restoration, water management, uh, nutrition sensitive food systems, but also climate change, a number of thematic areas. And we, you will always be informed. Uh, my colleagues uh, Fabio Picinic and Sara Ferrante, who are behind the scenes, will be keeping you informed. For today, we have um, a very interesting webinar and we are extremely lucky to have two senior experts from FAO. One is from the Nutrition Division, Rosa Roye, who will be uh, talking to us about, who will be sharing with us also uh, some some knowledge about how to reduce food loss. And uh, from the statistics division of FAO, we have um, Carola Fabi, who will be talking to us about the methodologies that are available to measure food losses. Now, uh, in, in, the, in, in these two, two cases, for, with Rosa Roya, we have, there is already a, an e-learning course available on the FAO uh, e-learning academy on, um, on food losses. And we are about to publish um, a, a course with um, Carola Fabi on, on um, the SDG indicator 1231. So uh, this is uh, all for now. I would like now to uh, give the floor to, um, to Rosa, who will be presenting us um, some ideas about how to reduce food losses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Rosa, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Good day, everybody. Afternoon, evening, wherever you may be, or good morning. It's a pleasure to today to be able to deliver this presentation titled Horticultural Chain Management. Managing quality and reducing post-harvest losses. 
Oops. I try to I'm having no problem to advance my slide. Sorry, I'm having a problem advancing the slides. Please, Aristide. Um, Rosa, I think you can simply advance uh, by clicking on your keyboards uh, or yeah, even with the not, mouse. It's just not moving, huh? Try also with the mouse. Okay, okay yes. now it's moving. Can I take, yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, okay. sorry for this, uh, this interruption. Um, since 1967, with the launch of the Action Program on Food, food Loss Prevention, FAO has been working with countries to address the reduction of uh, post-service loss in particular. And uh, then um, moving forward to 2015, you could see the blue arrows on the screen. Um, the world leaders um, across have endorsed the Sustainable Development Goals and SDG 12 in particular has given us a very strong imperative to scale up actions and initiatives to focus on food loss and waste reduction, and particularly to address post-harvest loss reduction, which is a subset of uh, food losses. Um, and also, this is most relevant at this time, um, particularly as we are facing the current uh, COVID pandemic. Now, SDG 12.3 target, in particular, calls for having per capita global food waste at, re at the retail level and consumer levels and reducing food losses along production and supply chains, including post-harvest losses. Uh, to get us all on the same page, what I'd like to do first of all is to introduce FAO's definitions on food loss and waste. Um, these are very well documented also in uh, the State of uh, Food and Agriculture, which was published, a flagship publication of FAO, which was published last year and launched uh, in October, uh, um, to October 2019. As you can see here, food loss is defined as the decrease in the quantity or quality of food resulting from decisions and actions by food suppliers in the chain excluding retail, food service providers, and consumers. Food loss effectively takes place between post-harvest and the wholesale markets. And Carola will also explain a little bit more on what she does in terms in that context. Food waste, on the other hand, is the decrease in the quality and quantity of food resulting from decisions and actors by retailers, food services, and consumers. So it effectively takes place at the retail level, in the food service sector, and at the consumer level. Now, why is it important to reduce food loss and waste? Um, reducing food loss and waste, and particularly post-harvest loss, which is a subset of food losses, as I highlighted, can bring about significant benefits to society as a whole. And they can result in increasing the availability of food, particularly for vulnerable groups, the most vulnerable groups. They reduce pressure on reducing food losses and waste reduces pressure on our natural resource base, the land, um, the water that is required uh, for production. It reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well um, that arise during production, um, as well as, as food goes into landfills. And it also increases productivity and economic, uh, uh, economic growth, while also contributing to other, the attainment of other SDGs, SDG2, which relates to nutrition, SDGs 13, 14, 15, and 8. So the, what we are looking at today is really where you see the, the, um, the, the blue arrows on the screen. The program titled Horticultural Chain Management is actually focusing on issues related to 
post-harvest loss reduction that is far upstream in the chain, as well as um, managing quality and ensuring improvements in uh, as far as possible in nutritional quality and content of food in terms of the way in which we manage the um, food as it transmit is as, as it transits from the farm up to the wholesale market. Now the program that uh, we are talking about today, horticultural chain management, was conceived by FAO somewhere in the early 2000s. Um, and that was at the time um, where we were working on the global initiative on post-harvest losses and we consulted in various regions on what their priority requirements were. And these, um, these um, two, the, the two manuals that we have produced were actually um, produced as a result of these consultations. Um, one was pro produced for the Southeast, Eastern Southern Africa in collaboration with the University of Pretoria, South Africa. And the other was produced um, in Thailand with a, a, a number of um, different stakeholders from across the Asian region. And it was uh, focused on, of course, that region. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that the, the the program for East and Southern Africa was actually supported um, by, the, with, by the partnership with the Commonwealth Secretariat and that for the Asia Pacific region was supported by FAO through multi-donor trust fund. Um, all of our work in both regions commenced with uh, classroom level training, site visits and hands-on activities um, in those training activities with the a broad spectrum of stakeholders. Um, but because of country demand expressed uh, by countries, in, particularly in the Asian region, um, a lot of this then transformed and transmitted into going into field level work. And I'll describe some of that in the course of my presentation. Where are we now with these publications? They were produced somewhere about between 2007 and 2009. We are now in the process of updating them because, as you can see on the screen, uh, fundamental issues remain the same. The objectives are to manage quality, assure safety, and reduce loss. But of course, we have to align our work with the, the sustainable development goals. And this is what we are doing as we go into our work in the field. So, a lot of what we are doing now is focused on looking at into innovations, uh, technical, technological, but also organizational business approaches to enhance um, the efficiency and the sustainability in the value chains in which we work. Okay, now I'd like to get into the heart of my presentation which is to focus on the actions at the field level uh, to manage quality, assure safety, and reduce loss. And in this context, I want to focus on the traditional supply chains um, because these are where you have the highest levels of losses in uh, horticultural crops, largely because of the fact this, these chains are very production-oriented, very fragmented, um, and then you have a very limited use of the post-harvest technology because this is where a lot of the um, small holders operate and um, with lim very limited resources, they're very inefficient. Um, when I worked in the Asia Pacific region, for example, it takes 24 to 48 hours quite often for produce uh, to reach the, the fresh produce uh, markets. Nevertheless, these are the supply chains that also feed the majority of people in mass markets. So in terms of the approaches that we take, we work at three levels, at the meso level, the macro level, and the micro level. Um, most, uh, much of the data and evidence that we generate to support the decision 
making by stakeholders um, is done at the meso level and we also do quite a lot of work integrating academia into the work that we are supporting at the field level in projects so that we can actually collect information technical information and data to underpin all of what it is we are doing with the stakeholders um, in terms of our stakeholders we are working at the meso level with uh, organized groups of farmers and supply chain stakeholders in all of our projects it's a fundamental requirement we do not work with individuals um, if they are individuals in some countries where systems don't exist we actually help facilitate and support them to to get organized and we also work in collaboration we also invite uh, private sector entities to work with us because over time what we have found is that when we bring in the private sector entities without any of our assistance or the, what happens in the course of a lot of these uh, training programs and activities at the field level is that business linkages are developed and uh, things move on so that uh, when we leave a lot of the countries there's already progress being made in terms of what we have implemented on the ground. In one of the countries that we work, for example, we invited members of the private sector from supermarkets to come in and to share with the, um, the, the participants of the meeting, the stakeholders, um, what their requirements were. And at the end of that meeting, at the, at the end of the training, they actually supported the, the, the supply of, of plastic rates to facilitate those smallholders in improving on the transport operations. And by doing so and transferring some of their post harvest activities back to the field, um, the quality that they received in their supermarkets was much higher, but also they um, increased the incomes of these uh, small holders by up to 40%. And uh, as I highlighted also, we all are engaged in working in collaboration with academia to also collect um, more information to really help us to enhance um, what it is we are doing in a more pragmatic and practical approach in terms of the next, um, the next series of, of, uh, of training programs that we develop. Um, now I like to look at some of the actions that we are undertaking on at the field level and to a large extent the field level implementation is designed to catalyze action and uptake of some of these technologies and the approaches that we're using and um, so that and to inform scale up of actions. So in so doing, we are building an evidence base through the conduct of surveys to understand, of course, market demands, as well as the knowledge, attitude, and, and practices of our stakeholders so that we can better address their specific needs. And then we move on to mapping the supply chain uh, towards identifying the critical loss points in the supply chains and their underlying causes. Now, it's important um, to identify these critical loss points because they are the points in the supply chain where losses are of the highest magnitude. They also help us to inform uh, measures to reduce food loss and waste. And uh, as my colleague Carola will highlight, they are a very important link to the food loss index. Once identified, uh, we begin to work with the stakeholders to identify innovations and some innovative approaches that are economically, socially, and environmentally suitable for the context and also to meet the needs of the specific um, target markets. And some of these innovations that we have found in our work actually sit on the shelves in research centers in many countries um, and from the early days of post-harvest intervention. So some of these we are able to do sometimes with some modification, we actually are able 
to put them to work and to through piloting with stakeholders and then we collect uh, a lot of the technical information the guidance documents and uh, use the, that information to develop uh, technical support materials that we, we distribute back to the um, stakeholders as well as some decision support material which is based on uh, the economic analysis and uh, more descriptive type of material, but I will come to that in more specific detail uh, later on. So now I'd like to give you, um, just go through an example of uh, some of the work that we have supported um, on the mango value chains, um, and this work was done in the Philippines. Um, this is, these are the, what you're seeing on the screen here, essential steps of the mango value chain in uh, the traditional mango value chains in the Philippines, where the mangoes are harvested using some of the locally fabricated harvesters. And they are then uh, packed, packaged in, packed into plastic crates for, and then sorted, um, after which they are transferred to this, um, these baskets that are very somewhat flexible. And then, as you can see in, um, in uh, the photograph D, they are stacked, the, these flexible baskets are stacked one on top of the other, and they are transported to the wholesale market. At the wholesale market in E, you can see where they are being um, repackaged and then moving into to the, the, the retail markets. And then, of course, um, a lot of the work that was done was to, to assess what was happening in retail, and it's not simulated retail, it's actually what is happening in actual retail conditions. And here you see what the mangoes look like on arrival at the wholesale market. Yes, all of them are saleable. Um, there's zero qual quantitative loss, but just look at the quality. Um, clearly, they suffered quite a bit of quality loss. If you look at A, B, and C, um, you see a lot of mechanical damage from um, bruising, uh, abrasion, um, sometimes on B, the marks of the bamboo basket, and so on. And then on from, uh, uh, from D and E and F, you see the latex staining on the mangoes. So, As a consequence of this, this damage, mechanical damage, the mangoes have a very short shelf life and they ripen, rap, uh, they ripen very rapidly. Like here you can see after five days, you have up to 90% compression damage becoming evident as the mangoes ripen. Also what happens as the mangoes are uh, maintained in retail, what you see happening, you see the manifestation of uh, latent infestations. Um, and these actually uh, pre-harvest infestations, which only become apparent when the mangoes begin to ripen. So that's another critical loss point that has to be addressed in, uh, in the supply chain. So this is a summary of what we actually put together after having done the work at the field level. And if you look here, you can see um, that based on the findings that have just um, described, what two critical um, interventions are, are required. One is that of reducing mechanical damage. And the second one is that of managing the latest latent infestations that uh, manifest and result in rapid uh, decay and the unsightly appearance of these uh, tomato, uh, sorry, of the mangoes. Now it's, it's quite interesting when you look at uh, here, the loss, you see that um, from harvest to, to, to wholesale, you see zero loss, but that's the quantitative loss. And what from what I show you, it was very clear that there's a lot of qualitative loss um, taking place. And, but um, according to our definition, 
that uh, I provided earlier on in the retail, that is waste. So because we have poor quality going from, from wholesale to retail, what happens, you have a very high level of waste and a short shelf life as a result. Now, as you can see here, um, by switching from the use of the, the straw basket to the plastic crates, you see that the level of severe compression has almost completely disappeared, even up to day five. And uh, the, the whole issue of um, all of these different types of the level of um, qualitative loss will also is also substantially reduced. And then again, um, you see the level of moderate compression also much lower than initially, but there's still some. Um, and what the uh, crates do, the use of the crates, they help to um, re minimize the mechanical damage by uh, because the crates are very sturdy, they are able to absorb the, um, the, 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 the um, vibration and um, in so doing make a big difference. Um, now to address the, the latent infestations, the anthracnose infestation and stem and rot, you can see if you look on the left hand side A and C, you see how attractive the, the mangoes actually look. Of course, you can see that we did not accomplish 100% um, reduction of the um, stem and rot in A, but you have a, a very sub substantial difference in terms of what you see on B compared to A. And uh, in the same for the anthracnose, you can see what happens in the traditional system versus the improved system. And there's a significant difference in terms of the appearance and the quality over five days in retail. And of course, uh, by using, applying the two treatments in tandem with good practice, you, you can see that oh, the economic benefit is generated because you improve the, both the quality and the shelf life. Now, the, 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 sorry, the um, hot water treatment is something that has to be done within the first 24 to 36 hours of harvest of the mango. It's not something that has, can be done at the, at the retail level. If it's not done within 24 to 36 hours of harvest, you still have the problem with the infestations. It's something that has to, to, to happen even as soon as the, the, the produce is harvested before it starts moving through the rest of the supply chain. So all of the evidence that we produced, uh, we produce in these types of um, projects is analyzed. And then we come up with uh, policy recommendations, which we document and also we disseminate to policymakers through our FA offices, our partners, and uh, also as we go along in terms of, and we use them to support different countries with the same sorts of issues and problems. Um, we also document a number of our, all of the work that we are doing and, gen and disseminate them as public goods. For example, we, don't, we document case studies, we produce uh, technical guidance documents, um, fact sheets, which uh, also provide decision support. They give a lot of the, the key elements of the detail of the economic analysis, what it means for shelf life and so on to help um, would be investors. We find the traders, we don't have very to convince them very much to do any of this because as soon as they see the benefit, they begin to start to invest in, in, in the improved technologies. For the average smallholder who is going into a traditional market, it's a little bit more difficult because of the, the issue of the access to credit to be able to um, procure the plastic crates. However, we see what we see emerging. We see a number of new business models emerging um, where you find that even now the, the transporters of the fresh produce are actually 
beginning to take up some of that work. So a number of these, um, the technical guidance documents are designed to actually support all of these different stakeholders involved um, to actually to do, to, to apply good practice um, in, in their operations during transport, during loading, unloading, anything that could cause any sort of damage and compromise quality is addressed in these guidance documents. And then um, also uh, they, they reproduce uh, different types of guidelines uh, to support um, further work with the stakeholders. These are some examples of some of the support materials that uh, we produce. Um, and also it's not only a targeting, of course, the, the uh, traditional supply chains, but also those who are interested to scale up uh, to the next level, we also have um, material to support um, that type of work. And of course, FAU addresses both, but in this case, a lot of the focus that we have had in much of, um, based on specific requests from the countries in uh, uh, the specific period in which we were working was to look at what was happening in local contexts. And then and we also share a lot of this uh, material through a dedicated platform to post-harvest loss reduction, food loss and waste reduction. That's our community of practice on food loss and waste, which is a convener of knowledge related to um, post-harvest loss reduction. It's now been expanded to talk about food losses, um, sorry, to talk about waste as well, food waste as well. And uh, it addresses um, both uh, pulses, different types of staple crops, as well as the perishable horticultural crops. Now, uh, last but not least, our, our micro level stakeholders, which are the most important to us, um, uh, the ones that I like to talk about, because they, we do quite a lot of training, awareness, sensitization, um, at the national level, but also with the specifically concerned groups. Um, so here I see some of the training programs. And then um, the other thing that we do is to bring the groups together after at the end of, end of the um, projects as, you know, as, a region, as regional groups. And this is work has, seems to be working out extremely well in terms of technology exchange and transfer within a specific region. Um, for example, this um, harvesting equipment that was um, developed in Bangladesh for mangoes became one of the most popular items demanded across the countries in South Asia because normally they would just shake the mango trees to, to harvest the mangoes. But when they saw the difference and the impact of this um, harvesting tool, it, it's something that has now become, it's, uh, many of the countries were very excited and interested in actually having access to and making and actually fabricating those uh, items of the equipment. And these types of regional um, gatherings also are extremely useful in helping people to develop networks that help them to share and exchange and address their specific um, issues and concerns. So I'd like to acknowledge that the work that I have uh, highlighted today and shared with you was supported by FAO through a letter of agreement with the University of the Philippines Los Banos and in the framework of a partnership between that institution and uh, FAO. In closing, I would just like to highlight that this year for the first time, the international and international day of awareness of food loss and waste will be observed on the 29th of September, 2020. Um, so we invite you to join us and stay tuned for more information about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosa. Thank you very much, Rosa, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Also, what I believe the participants uh, have appreciated is also the reference to the guidance document that give very practical tips on how to reduce food loss. 
um, just to, to mention that we are having really uh, participants from all over the world, from Greece, Spain, Cambodia, Bangladesh, India, China. I mean, really also uh, what, uh, what wasn't expected also from uh, Latin America because they're on a different time zones and we weren't expecting them. This is to say that I would like to ask you, Rosa, to please have a look at the questions and to uh, at the end of the seminar, we will give you the opportunity maybe to uh, respond to some of the questions because actually there were a lot of questions also related to the treatment of mango with hot water and other very practical issues. So maybe if you meanwhile have a look at the, at the questions and, and we will give you um, a space to, to answer them. Meanwhile, I would like to ask uh, Carola to... Uh, to, you have the floor, Carola. So Carola Fabi will be uh, um, describing a little bit the methodology that is being used worldwide to uh, basically um, measure uh, food losses. And um, there will be a, a new learning course that will be produced in the, in the coming weeks on, on exactly on, on this uh, thematic area. And I would like to remind you all that there is the FAO eLearning Academy has a, a course on uh, identifying the critical loss points along the food value chains, which is on the eLearning e Academy on the category uh, nutrition and food systems, where you can have access to it. These resources are free and available at any time, anywhere, uh, to anyone in the world. So the floor is yours, Carola. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Christina, and uh, hello to everybody. I mean, it's quite overwhelming to be speaking to 500 people from uh, all over the world. Uh, it's a great opportunity and honor. So I'm uh, taking over from Rosa and uh, bringing you to the other side <laughs> of the problem, which is the one on measurement. You will see a tremendous difference between uh, her presentation and mine, where there are no pictures. And actually, I was uh, thinking that I could have put some of the pictures from uh, the field surveys uh, to actually to give a better idea of how data collection uh, takes place uh, in the field. Uh, my presentation is still uploading. Uh, it still doesn't respond to, uh, to the commands. Uh, so, uh, like uh, I said, in fact, we are going to move from uh, the, uh, the practicalities, so the action to reduce losses along the uh, supply chain, to how to build the evidence base. And what FAO has done uh, in terms of public goods to provide uh, national and international stakeholders with tools uh, to improve knowledge on, uh, on food losses along the supply chain. Uh, like Rosa highlighted at the beginning of her presentation, this is a long process. A milestone was the very famous 2011 study uh, that uh, estimated at one third the amount of food produced that is uh, lost or waste uh, in the food chain. And uh, the, that study also shed the light on another factor, and it's uh, the dire lack of uh, data and uh, data scarcity that is underlying uh, the, the issue. And so the, the, weak, um, the weak amount of evidence uh, that is available. So what we are going to see, uh, she has also highlighted how um, uh, losses and decisions can take place at the micro, meso and uh, macro level. There is quite a lot of um, there is also there is quite a lot of knowledge around, but this knowledge is very scattered and is created with very uh, with a variety of definitions and measurement methods. So one of the problems in making decisions is that it is difficult to compare uh, the information, difficult to compare the data. So one of the things that uh, FL has tried to produce is a framework that helps putting the information at the various level, the very detailed and the very aggregated into a consistent place to build a consistent uh, picture of the problem and also have every single piece of information contributing to, uh, to the overall knowledge. Um, now, let's see, because really this does not seem to respond so the outline of my presentation uh, is, uh, I'll uh, go to another, I will share another, uh, uh, let's see if, okay, maybe the screen is smaller. 
let's see if with a smaller screen it responds better. Uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, is the screen moving with me? Maybe, oh, yeah, it's uh, moving. Or, I, yes, okay, good. I, it's, so, it's moving, but we can okay. see all the uh. Uh, I know. I will increase. Yeah. I will increase the size of the, uh, and maybe I move this one here that we don't need. Okay. Okay, and I increase the size of the slide. At least we can move on. Hmm? Okay. So fine. we're uh, right. So what was the problem basically in 2011? That the 2011 study also highlighted uh, the lack of a common definition. Uh, the lack, uh, the lack of a measurement framework, and the lack of data. So we're going first to really look at the boundaries and definition that led to a food loss index and an indicator for the SDG. We will see how the uh, basically the demand for data is so huge that one needs to focus uh, the data collection effort uh, and the evidence base. And this is what Rosa had started to talk about when she uh, highlighted the need for uh, carrying out value chain analysis to identify the critical hotspots and the causes of losses. So that information is paramount to be able to focus at a collection where it matters, where um, an intervention uh, matters. Then we will see what is the status of knowledge on food losses, especially in East and Southeast Asia, because this was supposed to be the biggest focus of this seminar. And uh, we will see a very short uh, um, overview of the food loss index, how it's structured, how it is interpreted and compiled, and uh, what are the available resources. So the methodology, the technical documents and other tools. So uh, we all know the target uh, that Rosa has also reminded us with its uh, two uh, components, uh, the uh, supply side and food loss component and the demand side consumption and retail uh, with uh, a food waste component. So the target has been because the two tracks of the food chain respond to different triggers and different policy questions and to some extent are linked even to other sustainable development goals. Uh, the two uh, elements of this uh, of the target have been uh, assigned to two different indicators. So we're going to focus on the on food losses on what happens on the supply chain from production up to but not including uh, the retail and this also replies to one of the questions of the participants who was asking why do we only speak about uh, food losses because uh, FAO had uh, the mandate to for uh, this indicator and because what happens on the supply side of the chain is also more relevant for the uh, traditional um, for the traditional value chains characterized by a large number of uh, smallholders so we focus the presentation on this uh, uh, more specific uh, aspect um, sorry, Carola, to interrupt you. Um, yes. A few participants are asking if you could put back in uh, full screen. Is that in possible full for screen, you? Full screen, maybe. Uh, let's see. Does it? Uh, let's see if it works. Yes. Now it has. Uh, it has updated. Uh, the. It has uploaded the whole file, so it works. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay, let's go on. Good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, one of the first efforts was really to set the boundary between the food loss index and the food waste index because these two indicators are quite different because they have to inform different sets of policies. And uh, so the food loss index and the measurement methodology that accompanies it starts on the farm and reaches the retail level and covers all the stages of the value chain uh, where that the product crosses and where losses can, uh, can occur. Uh, harvest losses or losses at slaughter are uh, a particular uh, point of the value chain and so they are treat, They are included in the methodology, but they are excluded from the international index. Uh, nevertheless, um, they are still uh, they are still covered by uh, by the methodology. So, um, I can, uh, yes? okay, Aristide, go ahead. I can, uh, we can hear you very well. Can you uh, try to talk louder and no, see if no, you're? Yes. Okay, so I will sit closer to the. And the, check your um, my microphone. Yeah, your microphone, um, please. 
Yeah, I think that something changed with your microphone settings because all of a sudden we can see, we can hear you, but you are farther. So just check on the small arrow that you see next to the microphone icon on the on the bottom. Uh, or okay, right now it's better. Now it's better already. It's better. Okay. Yeah, yes. I, I think that it's because I had received the call and rejected the call, so probably that interfered. Okay, with thanks. The, Thank you. Sound. So <laughs> yeah. Just go okay. back to okay. Uh, so. Yeah, that's right. So we were talking about, so uh, the first effort was really to clarify the boundaries between the food loss index and the food waste index. And losses in a sustainable development goal start with production and, and uh, at the retail. Um, now, uh, there, would, there would be a challenge in aggregating the food loss index and the food waste index because losses are about the efficiency of the value chain huh? and, there, uh, and uh, uh, we have heard Rosa talking about uh, the uh, income of farmers and so on and so uh, losses uh, are tracked along the value chain for single commodities huh? and they are expressed in the indicator in terms of percentage it's the percentage loss for that product in that place of the value chain whereas waste we hear in bulk, waste are the number of kilos per person, how much waste is produced uh, by uh, municipalities, by consumers, by the population as a whole. So uh, the 2011 study that had a very macro approach and that could cover the whole supply chain was very strong in raising awareness, but is not, was not really offering a tool for making this decision, which is what the food uh, reconciliation exercise, of course, then to have a combined food loss and waste uh, index, now that uh, there is a methodology for, uh, for the food waste index. I am very sorry, my internet connection is unstable. And so again, I cannot move the presentation. So I need to, okay, I need to go back to, the, uh, to, the, to this uh, kind of screen. Uh, the, so, uh, the, a lot of scattered information and one of the problems was the uh, enormous variability of definition of food losses. So Rosa presented the definition of food losses that has been adopted, which is a decrease in the quantity or quality of food. But for the measurement, the measurement has to focus on quantity losses only because it is complex and too complicated to measure qualitative losses all along the value chains for a large number of commodities on a national scale. What the methodology does is to recommend uh, collecting information on prices and on the destination of the products, because through the different prices and through the different destinations, one can infer on the quality, uh, on, the, um, uh, on, the lower, uh, on the lower qualities that leads to a lower price or even to a different destination, a product that can't be sold on the fresh market but that has to go to processing or even to some uh, less uh, valuable, uh, less valuable destinations. So the first uh, problem in collecting the data is really understanding the data needs. Like uh, Rosa said, food losses are not necessarily a, um, a, policy, um, a policy objective per se, but they serve other policy objectives. So it is important to understand what the political decisions are and what the priorities are on uh, uh, food loss in terms of where they occur in volume in percentages, how relevant the food loss points are, maybe because they concern a very large number of people, a very large number of smallholders or of households, and the cost effectiveness of a possible intervention, maybe because uh, in front of a small intervention cost, there is a very high benefit. And so that is going to be a priority area for intervention. That is where uh, a measurement, a good measurement is needed to be able to uh, measure the impact assessment, to do a cost-benefit analysis before, uh, before intervening, to analyze the trade-offs uh, and so on. But of course the lost data must be complemented on other information on the causal factors to see the impact of the change and on the economic uh, and um, economic environment as at, at large. Um, sorry, yes. sorry, Carla, to interrupt yes. you again. Yes. I see that a couple participants are saying that they cannot hear you clearly. I think that this is a connection issue. So what I would, 
What I suggest is that you can perhaps turn off your webcam. Okay, so the video. not a problem. But yes. you can still you can uh, still share the actually Aristide is gonna turn off your webcam and you can still go back to ah, the full okay. presentation. Okay, I stopped the video. Okay, so now you okay. can go back to full presentation mode and maybe slow down yes. a little bit because sometimes okay. there are some issues with the sound and maybe okay. it was because of the bandwidth of the of yeah. the streaming. So another important thing, uh, another important link between the data and the policy is really in seeing what are the effects along the value chain. In fact, uh, the SOFA report that uh, Rosa has introduced does a lot of in-depth analysis of the trade-offs along the value chain. Because by reducing losses and thus increasing quantities, there can be an impact on prices downstream. Greater quantities should lead to lower prices. Uh, or an impact on demand, a more efficient uh, food processing process might lead to a lower demand for, for the primary crop. So these are all aspects to be borne in mind, also in terms of the measurement. Where to do the measure, uh, what is the policy about, so where to do the measurement, what other input collect in order to have all the elements that are necessary to take the good decision and to monitor uh, the decisions. Um, okay, I'm uh, trying to go down, but again, uh, the, the presentation. Maybe you can stop sharing, yes. you can stop sharing and then restart sharing. And it will be really good if you can also go back to the presentation, full presentation mode because I think it's easier for, for some participants to see it. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, there are still some issues also with the sound. I'm sure this is related to the connection uh, from your area. I don't yeah, know if it could be what... in Rome, but here okay. it is. So it be... uh, I will do, okay, I will do something. Um, I will change my internet connection to my telephone that is uh, maybe stronger. Just be careful if you do that because you might be logged out if you go to another. Uh, okay, bank. so I don't. Okay, <laughs> so uh, let me uh, go back to the full screen. Okay, so uh, back to focusing the data collection effort. Uh, so the, the, the another key point is to choose. Uh, to, uh, to monitor only a few commodities. Uh, the, the commodities on which uh, the policies are looking at, uh, the, the action is taken, and focus on the critical loss point. And this is a necessary step to reduce the data collection effort. Because one of the reasons why there is so little data around is that uh, post-service losses are costly. They are complicated and costly. So the only way to uh, have good quality data is to reduce the scope of the surveys to the few areas uh, where they matter. The key commodities, the hotspots, uh, the critical loss points, and then uh, use a mix of uh, lighter estimation methods on the other uh, areas of value chain. Now, let's have a look at the current status of food losses. Uh, after the 2011 study, uh, we uh, developed a food loss estimation model whose results were disseminated with a SOFA report in, uh, um, in October 2019. And the estimates of the SOFA report are that losses along the supply chain after harvest, up to but not including the retail, are 14%. Yeah? So we are talking here of an apparently smaller percentage than the 2011 study, but one has to consider that the two figures are really not comparable. It's a different tract of the supply chain. It's a completely different estimation method, but these estimates come from a model, so they are replicable. Uh, we can reproduce them. And uh, um, uh, and uh, a lot of new evidence uh, has become available in the last few years. And so all this led to a different result, 
which is the one that we are starting to work with. Uh, to work with. Now, said so this, of course, there are huge differences across regions and there are huge differences across commodities. Um, this uh, is the heat map of the basic data underneath the model in the East and Southeast Asia region. And again, it's to show you how little data there is around. What you have on the columns are the countries where there is data. So it starts with Vietnam, uh, Vietnam, Timor Leste, uh, Thailand, and so on. So you see that there are fewer countries than you have in the region. And the columns are uh, the main uh, categories of products in the food loss index in the value chain. And on the left, the bluest column are cereals. So most of the information is available for cereal. Some information is available for fruits and vegetables, which is the next column. But when we move to the middle, where we have meat, for example, or other, uh, other crops, you can see that there is very little data around. And where you can see dark blue, it means that there are fewer than five observations over a 20 year period. Uh, so this really is to call for data collection and to call for the importance of building a sound evidence base because all the estimates that you see are built on this. All the estimates that you see around are built on this. Uh, this is the uh, a representation of all the officially reported data and of the data that was found in the scientific and grade literature around. Uh, having now a look at the status of knowledge on fruits and vegetables, I focused on fruits and vegetables also because there were some questions before, before the webinar on this particular, uh, on this particular sector. Um, these are, uh, this is the distribution of losses, of percentage losses for fruits and vegetables for all these in East and Southeast Asia. So you can see that they tend to be higher. Uh, than, uh, than the 14, uh, than the 14. Uh, Carola, percent. Carola, sorry, this is Christina. Uh, I read See? a few comments and they were saying if you can go back to the previous graph and explain well the color coding, this one, okay. yes. Yes, because okay. they would the like to coding? understand, they would like to understand okay. exactly what is uh, okay. on the two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the color coding is a legend on the right. It goes from dark blue to yellow and and uh, as it becomes more yellow, it means that there is more information. So there is very good information on cereals in Indonesia, and actually Indonesia tracked uh, rice losses uh, since uh, 2011. There is good information in Japan that has a light green on cereals and uh, yellow on meat, actually, meat and milk. Uh, the Philippines have got a fairly uh, large amount of data and also several observations on cereals. But when you see the dark blue in Vietnam, it means less than five observations. So the, the lighter the color, the more the information. This uh, heat map is automatically generated by an online database. You see the link on the slide. You can recreate it yourself for all the combinations of countries, commodities, um, uh, sources of data, and so on. So this is just an example. Uh, you can really, uh, this is one of the public goods that we have created, and uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can use it at leisure. Not only you can download uh, the data underneath, and the links to the original sources of this so information. So on the x-axis, basically, you have the different food, uh, the different uh, categories. food groups, and on the, uh, on the y-axis, you the have countries. the different countries. Exactly. The countries in East and Southeast Asia. Exactly. And so on the x-axis, you, uh, you, you then have the different uh, food groups, and, and then the color indicates, uh, the, um, of course, the amount of information available. Yes, that's right. Um, so, uh, this chart is another chart that is um, automatically generated by that database. And here we see the distribution of losses of food and of fruits and vegetables in East and Southeast Asia on the various stages of the supply chain. And uh, the uh, interesting part is to see the variability. So again, one can see the need for accurate measurements. 
because of course this is a summary of all the studies and all the countries so it makes a difference if losses are 10 percent or 30 percent uh, this is another um, analysis that we did. It's not a chart that you will find on the database, but it was really uh, the, a quick comparison of uh, uh, cereal losses in pink, fruits and vegetable losses in light blue, uh, across the various regions of the world. And uh, so you can see that um, East Asia, uh, in the end, has uh, very few observations because the dots are really very, very small. Uh, and, uh, East, uh, and Eastern Asia, here we don't have uh, Southeast Asia, but Eastern Asia has also got a relatively small, uh, oh, uh, relatively small um, uh, loss percentages in comparison with the rest of the world. For example, you can see fruit losses of South and Central America being much higher uh, than in the rest of the world here. And East Asia having very few observation points for cereals here. And the rest of Asia here, uh, where with, of course, fruit losses higher than cereal losses, but not, not that high. That high. So let's see now how this fits into the food loss index. So the observation at the very micro level, how do they progressively build and aggregate into a single, uh, into a single indicator? Now, how did the food loss index uh, uh, develop? Of course, it's to provide a, res a reply to uh, and give an indicator that says if there is a reduction of food losses along the supply chain by 2030. So that's what it measures. It's an index that starts at 100 in the base period, and then if losses are reduced, it, go, it moves below 100. So if in 2030 the index is equal to 90, it means that there has been progress on food losses reduction. Of course, uh, this, this is not, uh, let's say that this helps uh, the SDG monitoring, but it doesn't help decision making at the country level or at the, uh, or at the single value chain level. Um, although, uh, so the index itself, in fact, is based on food loss percentages. And food loss percentages can be interpreted as the percentage of production that does not reach the retail stage. This is already a figure that is relevant for decision making or for highlighting a problem or an opportunity to increase the efficiency of the value chain. And to compile the index, there are several steps. The first is really to select the commodities and compile the weights, okay, that's because one has to come to several losses of several commodities to a single figure. To compile the food loss percentages of the commodities, and that is the big challenge, and then comparing losses over time, one gets uh, the SDG indicator. So one thing about uh, the food loss index is that it measures uh, the loss percentages of the commodities over time. Why is that so? Because very often in the official estimates, in the, through the expert opinions, in the studies, what you find are uh, constant percentage losses that are applied across time. So if you look at the total losses that are derived as a multiplication of a percentage to total production, you will get losses that change over time, but in fact, it's production that is changing over time. So you see here that production fluctuates as usual in, uh, I mean, with crop, it's very obvious that yields change from year to year and you have the orange line. There is uh, an expert opinion generated loss percentage that is constant at 15%. And so there are the end showing losses in gray that show a kind of, uh, that show fluctuation, maybe a very weak trend, maybe not but it's an optical illusion. So it's by looking at the loss percentage that one can see the structural changes in the loss level. How the index is built is by looking at losses along the supply chain and the percentage losses along the supply chain to get to a food loss percentage for one commodity at the national level. No? And uh, so here you see the importance of the analysis of the value chain that uh, Rosa uh, was explaining um, in her presentation. Because one needs, this is a very 
simplified representation of the value chain, one needs to uh, one needs to have a description of the value chain for that commodity in the country, identify the hotspots, and do some accurate measures in the, in the actual uh, hotspots. Um, then, when building the food loss index, in fact, the loss percentages of the various uh, products are aggregated into one food loss percentage for uh, the whole country. And by doing a ratio of the food loss percentage in the current year to the base period, one calculates the index. The index is really the very last uh, step of the calculation, and it's the one that is relevant only for international monitoring, but not for decision making at the country level, which is, I understand, what is of greater concern for all of you. So let's see now in terms of the available resources and the, and the way forward. What uh, do we put, uh, what did we produce that you can uh, use? First of all, the food losses and waste database uh, already um, introduced with the three charts. This is the home page uh, of the database. You have the link. You can see here, these are all the, the filters for selecting your queries. And you can see here, there are the tabs. And so you can produce one of the charts that you saw. The last tab is the data. So you can see the table with the data, you can download it, and you can download the references to the original, uh, to the original uh, um, sources. We have produced um, a methodology for the food loss index that provides a common method, a method for uh, everyone to adopt for aggregating losses um, along the supply chain and for compiling the food loss index. But along with the method for the index, we have produced the guidelines for the measurement of harvest and post-harvest losses. This is the cover of the guidelines for grains. Those on fruits and vegetables are in the final stages of editing and uh, uh, the, uh, the ones on milk and meat and fish products are being uh, revised and ready for publication. We have also produced the technical reports uh, on the field tests hmm, that you will find online and some data collection tools, so uh, questionnaires for data collection both on paper and on a copy software, meaning that you uh, can use them to collect data directly on the tablet. Uh, the software is an open source, uh, so it's, uh, it's ready for use. You can, create your own, you can create your own survey. It's a software that has been developed by the World Bank, uh, to which FAO has uh, contributed. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's open for use by, uh, by any institution or entity that uh, is interested in uh, using uh, the copy software for uh, uh, digitized uh, data collection. Uh, the guidelines on the measurement of harvest and post harvest losses have got their own uh, uh, e-learning, and there is a forthcoming e-learning that Christina has already introduced on the food loss index and on the indicators methodology. Now, what uh, do the guidelines for data collection cover? In fact, they uh, cover uh, a mix of measurement methods and estimation methods. And very importantly, they do a distinction between the data collection method, uh, so a survey and experimental design, a measurement method, so do you interview or do you scale uh, the product, and the estimation methods, so do you use a model to do the estimate or um, do you scale up the results uh, from the sample? And the data, uh, so you will find um, uh, a variety of uh, tools and methods that are described with recommendations for every stage of the value chain on which particular methods to use. Of course, we recommend using sample surveys, even if it is the most demanding method, because sample surveys are representative. You can tell uh, they can be representative on a national level and they have a known accuracy. So you know how accurate or uh, how accurate the estimate is or what is the error size. Uh, more importantly, sample surveys are really the only way to have a good measure 
in the case of a traditional value chain where there is a multitude of very small operations. Um, expert opinion, uh, producers associations uh, um, uh, can, uh, can give a very um, accurate uh, estimate when uh, the, we are talking about few commercial uh, technicized operators who have the, who know their business and who keep very accurate accounts and uh, um, uh, and who can analyze uh, their process but when it comes to small farmers uh, small transporters and so on uh, the only way is to do a sample survey with an enumerator that does uh, that does the measurement and we are going to to talk about that also at the very end of the of the presentation and no, but uh, Carola, Carola, we, we need to come to an end because... We, I'm at the end. Uh, I have two we more need slides. To come to an end. Okay. And, uh, so what, okay. Uh, what there I, it is. Like okay. Uh, this is the last slide. Okay. Okay. I'm skipping one slide. And uh, so what, uh, what next? I mean, uh, to, uh, to increase the, the, the evidence base. In fact, FEO has got this two-pronged two and collaborative approach to data collection. One is really to assist countries in collecting food loss data. And one is to assist in countries in estimating the losses with a model uh, where the, the data is too scarce to, uh, to, be, to be used uh, directly as such. But uh, one thing is that, of course, all the efforts, what we really advocate is that data collection efforts should be part of a wider strategy. So they should piggyback on existing surveys. We uh, offered a methodology to ensure consistency and comparability over time and across countries. But the only way to really make this happen is through partnerships at all level. So partnerships with the national stakeholders, international partnerships across development partners in order to focus maybe on different areas, different geographical areas, different tracks of the value chain, different types of the value chain, and partnerships with the private sector who has the strongest knowledge, especially in the central tracks uh, of the value chain. So uh, this is my final point. I understand that I went above. I'm sorry for the technical uh, problems I had. Uh, so the, the floor is to the 500 participants. Yes, so thank you very answers. much, Carola. So uh, I will uh, now give uh, the floor to uh, Rosa to uh, answer some of the questions. Meanwhile, Carola, look at the questions that were asked during uh, your session because there have been various uh, questions. However, I, um, I feel the need because I noticed some of the questions to just um, provide some clarifications. First of all, um, for those who are not aware, um, the, the United Nations have a framework which is called the Sustainable Development Goal uh, Agenda 2030, which uh, consists of a number of indicators and uh, that, that countries have to collect at national level to be able to, uh, using of course the same methodology, to be able to do two things. One is to compare their value with the other countries. Number two is also to understand what is the trend for your country. So what Carola was, um, uh, what Carola presented is the methodology that is being proposed at international level for all countries to use to measure food loss at national level. Um, this methodology, and this needs to be um, clearly spelled out, this is not an FAO methodology. This methodology has been developed collaboratively with all the countries uh, in the world and has been validated by all the countries because then they're the ones who have to apply it to be able to have a national value for the food uh, uh, index indicator. So um, meanwhile, um, what Rosa presented, and there is actually, as I was mentioning, an e-learning course that covers exactly uh, the, the how to identify the critical loss points along the food value chains 
for the different commodities, that course is actually very, very useful for countries to take decisions and to understand where they have to intervene along the food value chains to reduce these losses. So, um, so these are two aspects of the same uh, issue, and this is why it was um, we we designed this uh, this webinar uh, strategically in order in order to cover uh, the, these aspects of of the same issue. So now I will give the floor to Rosa. You have uh, five minutes maximum to respond to some of the questions. Of course, we will not be able, there are uh, uh, more than 500 participants asking questions. So we uh, will be answering for five minutes and then uh, some of the questions will be answered afterwards in a Word document. And both the recording, the presentations, and, and also this uh, document with the answers to the questions will be made available through the FAO eLearning Academy where you can always find the information. And um, so now the floor is yours, uh, Rosa, just to give a, a few uh, an answers to uh, uh, some of the questions. You have five minutes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for all of your very interesting questions. Um, I noted uh, quite a few questions for information and I will share with you again the link to the community of practice on food losses and waste because all of the material that we have produced so far is accessible online at, on the community of practice. There's another set of questions that surround the issue of value addition to mangoes. And certainly, yes, FAO does support this area of work. We didn't go into that specific area today because our focus was more on the, the fresh produce uh, uh, handling. But certainly, this is an area that um, FAO addresses. Um, other questions were surrounded um, the issue of the cold chain versus, for example, hot water treatment. Um, the cold chain is not a substitute for hot water treatment. The reason why we apply hot water treatment is to manage the pest and disease infestations. The alternative to that, if we go into pre-harvest, um, one would be looking at uh, bagging of the fruit at a certain stage of their development um, while they're in the field to prevent uh, the pest infestations. Um, and if we are looking at uh, the post-harvest stage, one, uh, this, the other option would be vapor heat treatment, but that is a very costly, um, the equipment required for vapor heat treatment is very costly. And so um, to a large extent, we still see, uh, with the exception of very, a few important countries like Japan, where they're very, very stringent on quarantine issues, um, to a large extent, you see, you still find that the hot water treatment is the more widely used treatment. I also saw another very interesting um, question related to the possibility of developing a network, creating a network around um, this, the, 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 the issues discussed here today. Um, this is something maybe we could consider a poll to see if there's any interest in, in moving forward along those lines. So it's something that we could um, explore further if there's interest and see how something like this would work out. And then there were um, questions about standards, public standards, private standards um, related to you know what it is that uh, is uh, happening in that in the context of um, standards and for quality and safety. Of course, um, if you are going into export markets or supplying specific um, suppliers, like for example, um, the supermarkets to a large extent have specific requirements. You have the the meeting the GAP standards. Specific retailers um, have the specific private standards that have to be met, and of course, government also governments also have their their requirements. This is why a lot of the times you, if if you're going into international trade, cross border trade, there's certain specific quarantine requirements, and that these things have to be these requirements have to be adhered to the specific food safety 
um, re um, regulations and so on that uh, some of them are also, um, public, public sector uh, related, others are, um, you know, the requirements if you are going to supply specific markets um, or specific um, buyers with uh, fresh produce. Um, then uh, someone asked whether the private sector will invest in supporting um, smallholders. And yes, that's our experience in the Asian region that yes, that happens because that's one of the reasons that they're always very much involved. We invite them to give presentations so that the smallholders get a sense of what it is that the private sector is interested in, in, in procuring. And so um, where they really see a, an opportunity, and I gave an example in my presentation about um, the case of bananas, where there was a private entity who was buying bananas at the field level, transporting them to their warehouse. And uh, only because they, you know, if you have bananas over time, like the mangoes, it's only as they ripen, you begin to see the level of compression damage. That's a loss for them. But when they participated in the training, what happens is they realized that uh, if they train this, with the training of the smallholders, they could give them the um, crates where they could do all of that work at the field level. And it benefits both of them because they get a blemish-free banana coming into the, into the, um, the, the supermarkets with a better quality, better shelf life, better price for them. And at the same time, the smallholders benefit from 40% uh, on average. This is what we get. For, I've seen it in the mango chains, tomatoes. It's approximately 40% increase in, um, in terms of the income to them. Okay. Um, then. Thank you very much, Rosa. Okay, I would yes. like now to pass on to uh, Carola, maybe to answer some of the okay. questions uh, that you believe are relevant for, for all participants. Carola, the floor is yours for five minutes, and then, then we will be closing. Uh, all right, let me get back. Ah, okay, right, I've been unmuted, thank you. Uh, right, well, it, actually, there have been a lot of questions, and uh, I was trying to, to group them. Um, a little bit. Okay, first of all, some questions are on the resources. Um, so uh, the material that I have shown is available online. Uh, you will find the link. The presentation, I will add them anyway to the reply to questions. And for the material that might not be online, uh, please contact me. Uh, then there was a question on, there, are, there, there was a question on the boundaries. Why was harvest loss why were harvest losses excluded from the international index? That is because uh, we, uh, we measure losses as a percentage of production. And uh, production is measured in agricultural statistics net of harvest losses. So one needs to change the production number to do a correct calculation of that percentage and it would be too disruptive uh, of, um, of the time series yeah, of the agricultural statistics. So it is something that we, uh, we um, of course, the method is there. And uh, at the country level, it can be done. But at the international level, to keep the comparability of uh, the production figures, uh, we have excluded, I mean, harvest losses were excluded from the scope of the international indicator. Uh, retail markets, very good point. Uh, the fact that wet markets play the same role of wholesale and retail. Of course, uh, the, 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 the way the SDG was formulated, once it is formulated, it is there. And it does not really reflect all the realities. And there is a fuzziness in the boundaries. Huh? Uh, where does uh, the supply chain stop the same market being retail? So we, the, the, the methodology had to reflect the, for, the formulation of the indicator. Uh, in, uh, in countries where uh, retail and wholesale, are, in fact, uh, retail and wholesale are so merged, uh, well, the retail market, uh, losses at the retail market uh, may be incorporated into the food loss index as it is a natural prolongation. 
or, um, or the other way around. The European Union is incorporating um, uh, whole sales uh, into, into the, the food waste index and into, so into the retail. So uh, uh, one has to make choices and uh, then of course there have to be adaptations um, to, the, um, uh, to, the, to the local situation. Um, why uh, so much focus on the primary commodities? Because when um, uh, the index attempts at measuring losses as a percentage of production, so it becomes commodity specific, even if along the supply chain the commodity gets transformed. Now, in fact, there is a bit, again, there is a bit of a fuzzy boundary between losses and waste. At the second or third stage of food processing, when all the ingredients get mixed, and to some extent, food processing is replacing cooking in the household. Uh, so, uh, uh, at that point, uh, it, it is even difficult to understand what is the percentage loss of a single component. But uh, again, uh, because of this clear divide and because the, yeah, between uh, the supply side and the demand side in the SDG formulation, and because uh, they, are, they respond to different policy concerns, uh, we look, uh, we bring back all the processed commodities into their uh, primary equivalent. And there was a question also on fish. Why is fish not there? Fish is there in the methodology, in the guidelines. It is not there in the database uh, because we didn't, uh, um, because uh, there is an FEO database on, uh, on fish loss assessments. And um, we still need to integrate that one uh, into, into ours. Uh, you stop me, Christina, when uh, yes. five minutes are gone. Otherwise, I... No, no, stop. Uh, we need okay. to stop. Okay, thank you okay. very much, Carola. Actually, I'd like to start by thanking the two um, experts that we have had the, the luck and the pleasure to have uh, with us uh, on this food loss uh, webinar. I would like to also thank um, Fabio Picinic and Sara Ferrante for the management of the all the, and asked, uh, Aristide also uh, for the management of the platform and all the logistics behind this event. I would like to thank our partners, Agrinium and also uh, UNSCAP who have helped us to disseminate the information about, about the webinar. And I would like to thank you, all the participants, over 510 participants from all over the world who have sent fantastic questions, really very interesting questions. This is really a wealth to be able to have this interaction with all of you all around the world. And we will be uh, trying to respond to all these questions because the questions and the answers to the questions is really extremely valuable to everyone. So we will try to develop a document with all, uh, compiling all of this and sharing it with all of you. We really look forward to having you with us in the next webinar. We will be informing you about the thematic area. Meanwhile, have a look at the, the um, we are inviting you all to come and have a look at the FAO eLearning Academy that offers all of these um, e-learning courses on all the thematic areas that we will be covering. It's very easy. It's elearning.fao.org. Thank you very much to all of you for this. We really look forward to seeing you very soon with us. Bye-bye. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, as said, we will, sh we will share also the link to the recording in the upcoming days. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks to everyone.